starting. Hello, Hello. everybody. <laughs> this time we're going to do a new thing. Grace and I are both going to talk, and we're going to share some stories that we have. Uh, we, we have recorded in our minds many, many stories that show God's wonderful hand, his provision, his protection, uh, everything like that, his leading and uh, guiding. And so we want you to just be thrilled. We're going to boast about God tonight. <laughs> right, honey? Yes, yes. Amen. I'm so glad. Jack has a real good memory. I can't remember what city, what nation. It's all kind of blurred, but we got some pictures and we got, well, God did marvelous things. He did. Now, you know that God called us early on to the Karen people in Burma, but uh, we're going to give stories of various nations. And so the first one I want to talk about is Tajikistan as one of the five stands of Asia, which used to belong to Russia. But now these are all independent nations. And Tajikistan has a capital city called Dushanbe. And Grace and I went there in 2007. And we had a wonderful time. And uh, we were not able to plant a kingdom training center, but we sowed a lot of seeds. In fact, we sowed uh, uh, 10 of A.L. Gill's manuals there. And I'm really not sure, maybe the guy started a training center. But let's t tell you the story about it. We were uh, uh, walking down the street and we saw a big square, the main square of the town. And it was called Somoni Square in Dushanbe. And it was to honor Ismail, Dush, uh, Ismail Somoni. And his statue on horseback is there. He was uh, a Tajik from uh, centuries ago. And there was a, a series of three fountains and they were going about 20, 25 feet in the air, beautiful fountains. And the, uh, the area around the fountains, you, you had to climb up on steps, maybe eight or nine steps. And then there was a map area where they showed a whole map of Central Asia with Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and the, and the others, and the main cities there. And so, we went there, and I was ooing and eyeing over that. <laughs> and uh, a policeman wandered up. Well, actually, we had prayed and asked God, Lord, give us a contact here. Someone who would be able to take the manuals and open a Bible school. At that time, we were just calling them Bible schools. And so... Uh, we said, we're going to wait here uh, until you bring someone. Well, the first one that came along was not the person. It was a, a policeman. Well, we were praying in tongues. The Lord yeah, said, we just go there tongues. and pray in tongues, and yeah. I'll, I'll show you what to do. <laughs> right, so we did. We prayed in tongues, and, and um, there was a place there to rest on a bench. The policeman came along, and asked us uh, who we were and wh why we were there. Fortunately, I was able to speak to him a little bit in Russian because they had been under the Russians for more than a hundred years. And so they did speak it. And so uh, between his Russian and my stumbling Russian, we were able to, to talk a little bit. And uh, the guy wanted to know about America. Of course, they always do. And so after about, about 10 minutes of talking, uh, uh, we remarked about the fountains, how, how beautiful they were, and the map and all that. And then uh, we said, well, we should go, honey. And we stood to go, and, and the Lord s spoke to Grace. What did he say to you? <laughs> Uh, could not could you not tarry one hour? Because <laughs> we had been about fifty minutes, and I thought, well, nothing's happening. But he said, couldn't you not tarry one hour? 
So we said, okay, um, 10 more minutes. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> send somebody, please. <laughs> now, so we waited there. And at just about the one hour point where we were about to go, a young man came up to us and started to talk to us. And we talked to him a little bit. Did he know any English, honey? I, I don't think he did. So, but again, my smattering of Russian really helped. And uh, we found out that this young man was homeless. He had been kicked out of his family because he was a Christian and his whole family was Muslim. And so they kicked him out. And <clears throat> we talked to all and I said, we're here to open a Bible school for Christians. And I said, we have manuals at our hotel. And if you come there tomorrow, we'll be able to give you 10 manuals in Russian, which you can use. You can use them however you want to, but open a Bible school here. Well, we said, are you hungry? Have you eaten? Yeah, he looked a little, <laughs> you know, he a, said, a little I'm, hungry. I'm hungry. <laughs> so he said, okay, we'll go across the street here and we'll feed you. So we did. We went uh, right behind the Uzbek uh, parliament, there was a, a restaurant. And so we brought him in there and he ate a lot. <laughs> he was hungry. <laughs> and so after that, uh, he, he came back to the hotel the next, the next day. morning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And we presented him with the manuals, the A.L. Gill manuals in Russian. And he was just thrilled with them, beside himself. Oh, this is wonderful. And I said, now, when you can, open the school. Now, I know you're homeless, but you'll be able to find someplace. Somebody will take you in. I said, God provided you for us. God will provide a place for you. And so that was a marvelous provision of the Lord. And it was the last minute. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. I think I'm going to pull this camera a little bit closer. Okay. So the, there, how's right. that? Hello, everybody. I see some friends. <laughs> Amy Sue and some other ones. Go uh, God is so good. Like we said, we want to boast about God. Yes. Um, and let's see, we started our Bible schools in 1990, was it, right. or 89, and God brought these students through the jungle um, on a boat and knew there was a free uh, Bible school, and it would be in English. Uh, so Jack actually went uh, ahead of me because there was no place to live. I didn't know. And so he went and um, I was going to come a couple months later after he constructed something and made an outhouse for we me. We built the campus <laughs> and a house for us. We call it the Bamboo Hilton. So I, uh, he said, now, honey, when you come, or I don't know, it must have been by a phone. We didn't have internet then. We no, had called by the phone. There he was said, no internet. Honey, when you come, bring a thousand dollars. And I thought, what do you mean? I don't have a thousand dollars. We we spent everything we got um, to to get there. <laughs> and he said, well, we had written this book about heroes from our heritage, and he thought, well, that book is going to sell. <laughs> well, it did not sell, maybe a little bit, but anyway, uh, I got thinking, a thousand dollars? I don't have it. I don't have it. So anyway, I got into this scripture, and let's see, I'll give you it to you. It is Leviticus 26, uh, 9 and 10. And it says, so I will turn toward you and make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will um, uh, confirm my covenant with you. And you will eat the old supply and clear out the old because of the new. Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul will not reject you. And I also walk among you. And I thought, clear out the old. Okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll go to the cupboard and I guess maybe you got a lot of things hidden in the back corner of your cupboard that are outdated. <laughs> and so I did. I think, well... But what I did, whatever money came in, I bought a music CD. I bought, I got to have, I got to praise God. I got to have some new music. So for whatever, maybe they were $15 at that time. 
at the Christian bookstore. So each, uh, I think, a, well, two months, I mean, I bought a music tape, tape every other week, and the money came in, and finally... Grace feeds on music. <laughs> Yes, I had right. to, and I said, well, I, I could lose some weight. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> so I didn't look at the date on the cans or whatever and just really praised and worshipped God. And, okay, so then I met him at the airport. That's kind of a long story, too. But anyway, he had a house prepared for me. It was in the jungle there and a little table. It, was a, it wasn't a dirt floor, was it? No, no it because was it was dirt, raised it, up. Bamboo yeah. floor. Bamboo, um, yeah. So anyway, um, uh, we stayed, was it three months, I think. Yes. And uh, another friend of ours knew, I don't know how he knew, but um, I think maybe our daughter told him, because we said, oh, we're, we're just eating what we got in the house. We're fine. We're fine. We're, we're praising the Lord. We came back, was it five months later? Three months later. Okay, um, well, I've um, been gone a long time. We came back, and in the kitchen of this house, there was food all over the counter and baskets of food on the floor. Um, my daughter had made some homemade peanut butter cookies, and there was so much food. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like cheap food. <laughs> it wasn't, it went to a um, uh, more expensive store and got me food and I thought oh god you said clear out the old and make room for the new literally right. that right. can happen that right. can happen as we clean out because I was praising him he is a good God I want to boast and, on him and what happened was a pastor that we were associated with not our home pastor but another one uh organized his church to give us a food drive and boy they got a lot of food Richard Biddle Biddle yeah he did a good job for us and uh, we we ate that food for a long time we really appreciated it okay one more story and then I'll give it over to Jack another thing happened in that same year it was 1991 in the scripture because we we're pressing in and here it is in Exodus um, 23, verse 20, uh, Exodus 34, verse 23, and it talks here. Three times a year, all, all the males are to appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will drive out the nations before you, enlarge your borders, and no man shall covet your land." Your um, land, when you go up three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. You know, they were commanded to leave their um, their homes there and go to worship for the Passover. At Jerusalem. Uh, at Jerusalem. They had to leave and go to Jerusalem for the Passover, for Pentecost, and what was the, the tabernacles. The Feast of three Tabernacles. Three times a year. So they had to leave. And maybe the whole family left, and I thought, Three times a year, we are going, and it said that he would watch over our land, that nobody would covet it. And we thought, God, you're going to have angels around our house. Of course, we're going to have the lights on the switch that they will turn on, the sprinklers will go, so people won't know we're gone. And God is going to watch over our place with angels here, because he said no one will covet our land. So that literally happened literally happened so now though this has changed what 20 years later we do have a security system because things have changed uh so but we have angels we have angels okay put your face back on you're off you're off here we are <laughs> okay <laughs> i believe it was in 2009 that we went uh 2011 we went to japan and we, be, being remote area ministries, we don't go to the large cities usually, but we go to more, more remote places. So we didn't choose the main island of Japan, Honshu. We chose Hokkaido, the northern island. And we went to Sapporo, the capital. And, you, you know, uh, folks, I must confess this to you all. I grew up during World War II. 
I was seven years old when the war started, and I had a hatred for the Japanese who attacked us at Pearl Harbor and who had the Bataan Death March, killing thousands of our soldiers who surrendered. They were cruel, awful, and uh, I, I really hated the Japanese. And so <clears throat> throughout my life, I didn't have much opportunity to get in touch with them. But now, when the Lord asked us to go to Japan, the first thing I had to do was forgive. The very first thing, else you can't go and minister. So I did forgive them. I, and it wasn't easy. I had to just wipe out those memories, all of them, from Bataan to Guadalcanal to Peleliu to the Philippines to everything, to Okinawa and Iwo Jima, wipe out all those memories and receive them for who they are. God wants them for his people. So <clears throat> I did that. We got there and Japan, of course, had changed a lot. They modernized and uh, they didn't have uh, the same old stuff that they did during the 40s. But we asked the man where we were staying in the hotel, could we find, could he find a Pentecostal church for us to attend on Sunday? And so he spoke English and he got out the phone book and he found one. And I said, would you call a taxi cab for us tomorrow morning? We'll, we will go to that church. So he did the next day. We took the taxi cab across town and there was a little Christian church there, and about 30 people showed up. But we didn't it, speak Japanese. No, we... we, we thought, we're trusting you, God, that there'll yeah. be someone here that speaks English. Oh, I, I, I know how to say thank you and please and those things, but no, I can't carry on conversation in Japanese. So there were fortunately one woman there who she spoke English. The piano, the worship the, leader. The worship leader spoke English, and oh, what a blessing that was! So she introduced us to the pastor, and we stayed for the sermon, the message, and after the message, he asked us through the woman, "Would we like to say anything?" <laughs> Depending on the woman to translate. <laughs> And so we offered to pray for anyone who had pain in their bodies or sickness. We like to pray in the name of Jesus. And do you know, 15 of the 30 people came and stood in the front. They yes, had yes. either pain or stiffness. They couldn't move. They couldn't kneel down. Nothing like that. And thanks to our God, who is merciful beyond what we would think, he healed every one of them. Yes, he touched them. They felt the power. They of felt God. the power of God, and He healed them all. And I he remember did. especially this one old man. I say old; he's probably as old <laughs> as I am now, <laughs> about 84, 85. He could not kneel down, and he couldn't crawl. After prayer, he did just that. He kneeled down on the floor, and he crawled forward on his knees without pain. He was big smile on his face. Oh, that was worth a lot of money <laughs> to and see him. Then they invited us to stay for lunch. Yes, and they had a little uh, potluck lunch there. Noodles. Noodles, <laughs> yeah. And it was good. We oh, enjoyed it so much. We're so kind. And at the end of that time, we asked them to call the taxi cab. They did, and we got back to, to the hotel. But the main thing is, I learned a lot there. You have to forgive people before you can minister to them. If they've love hurt you them. in any yep. way, you're going to love them unconditionally. Thank mm -hmm. you, Lord, for teaching me that. Yes. Very yes. important. Okay. You want to tell the one about Batagai, the guest house? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> we went to Batagai, Russia for the first time in 2001. God had said, uh, go up there. In fact, we had been praying for that area. It's called the Verkhoyansk area or the Upper Yana River. 
in Siberia now, and it's eastern Siberia. Uh, and so we caught a flight to Moscow and Moscow to Yakutsk, the capital of Yakutia. We had prayed for the Yakut people for two years. And finally, God said, now that you've prayed for them, I want you to go and minister to them and open a school there. So we did. And we got up to the, um, the airport. <laughs> That's another story. We, we had a small Antonov 24 airplane from uh, Yakutsk to Batagai. And the tires were so worn that the tread showed through. The cord showed through the rubber. And the runway up there at Batagai was not paved, it, only stones. And they loaded that small airplane, that Antonov, the passengers loaded it. They just threw their suitcases in the door and nobody arranged them. Nobody checked the balance. I thought, oh boy. We had extra boxes of uh, coats and jackets yeah. that we brought. Yeah. So we got up there safely, thank God. And there was no one there at the airport to, to meet us. And so <clears throat> fortunately, I, I could ask the guy at the airport, uh, is there any way we could get into town? The town was about five miles away, down the hill into the town. And he said, you, this man here will drive you in his truck. He had a pickup truck. And uh, so we got in. Uh, our stuff, and we drove in, and the house we were supposed to have on a certain street was locked up, and there was no one around. So the man said, you could go to the Yana River guest house. That's the only hotel, only one. So he said, okay. So he pulls up to the Yana River, guest house and there was a big padlock on the door. We were about a hundred feet from the guest house and great big padlock. I've never seen one that big. It must have weighed 50 pounds. <laughs> and I said, Lord, what are you going to do now? You know, we weren't discouraged, but I said, Lord, what are you going to do now? What's next? All of a sudden, the house next to the Yana River guest house, door opened, and a woman came running with a big key, you know, like the key to the city for that big padlock. And she yelled, Prichadichia, Prichadichia, come, come, and motioned us with her arm. So we came, and uh, <coughs> we, we rented the guest house for two weeks. And we had a good time there. We fortunately, this time we had uh, Alex Soldatnikov, a pastor from Sacramento, who was a native Russian speaker uh, with us. So uh, he smoothed the way for us. But we, we were amazed up in the Arctic, whether it's Alaska or Russia, things aren't as nice. As, as lower down, well, the lower latitudes. The floor uh, sunk in, you know, with permafrost or whatever in right. the summer, then the floor sinks right. in and the beds right. sunk in and the old springs on the bed. And The beds were curved like this. There was no food <laughs> there, but we had brought some oatmeal and some um, peanut butter, but they did have electricity and they could have, give us some hot water for tea. Right. So that was, that was good. And they were very hospitable. They were. Very hospitable. Yeah, they they were amazed that Americans would come there, just shocked. And so, but we had a very pleasant two weeks there. And uh, we weren't able to start the school that trip. But the next one, a year later, we went back to the same place and were able to begin the Bible school. Oh, Hallelujah. and they graduated. Did we go three times? Yeah, three times. And then the woman who graduated became the mayor of the city. But bought the guy. Right. Oh, uh, that was that was, um, the the streets were paved with uh, the bones of the prisoners. Right. From that the war. used to be a gulag. Yeah. And Stalin had put his political prisoners up there. 
and uh, the streets were paved, well, not paved. The streets were the foundation of them were the bones, bones of those prisoners. Of the prison, probably yeah. Christians. So, anyway, well, should I tell the story of Mongolia? <laughs> <laughs> but just to show you, God provides for you. When you go, you don't have to worry. Even if the plan, place you were planning to stay is closed, God okay. will find another yeah. place for you. Oh, let me go back to when we went to the, uh, that tribe, that, that provision. Remember, uh, we did have a school uh, established there among the Karens. Um, but we usually would make the reservations to go and, uh, um, the money came in, uh, but this one time we were planning to go and we had no money for food for the students. And did we have about 10 students and then we had our we had workers 10 students there. at that time. And Stein and Jewel were with us and uh, the workers that worked the campus and all of that. And so they were depending on us for the money. All told and, about 15 people. And uh, we had our tickets paid for, but we had no money for food. <laughs> and so anyway, we're, we're going anyway. Well, God's going to bring it in. I don't know how. But anyway, uh, one of our friends said, Grace, hey, I'd like to take you out for lunch today. Is that okay? I said, oh, sure. I'd love that. So we went out to lunch. She gave me a check for $1,000 just enough time to go to the bank <laughs> to get it cashed or put it into our account or whatever. So that was a miracle. Sometimes the last minute it comes in. So we had enough to pay and then a thousand dollars stretches quite a long ways when it you're goes very far when you overseas. were in Thailand. So that was great. Okay, the Mongolia thing. Shall we talk about that? <laughs> We may go a little bit longer, but anyway, okay, help me with this. Um, we were uh, given money to go to Mongolia to just go there under uh, Robert Slaird in uh, Operation 500 or something. And so we got the money to go there. But Jack said, we need to go to Hove, just way on the west. Western we, Mongolia is a remote area, believe me. And we have the manuals in uh, um, Russian. 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 So we went there and we had reservations in a hotel. But, you know, we, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're not really good. Um, but anyway, then we went to Hove that was way on the west there. And as our practice was, we would go find the high place where the uh, people would go and they would, um, they'd have all these flags hanging, you know, to attract the evil spirit. Well, repel them. <laughs> repel them or whatever. But anyway, they're blowing in the breeze there. Maybe they were there prayers that were to go up right. uh, to Buddha or something like that. So right. all these flags. Like, and so we wanted to go to the high place because we're going to pray there. So we said, well, where's the high place? And uh, we got a tourist guide, didn't we? And we right. paid her. And, and so she took us. Down. And what did we find? A pile of stones, about three feet high of oh, stones. It was, honey, it was, it was large. It was about six feet. And there were thousands of stones there and that they would pray there people who were crippled or people who had a habit of drinking themselves drunk and then when they were delivered from the habit or healed from their their cripple crippledness they would leave the crutches there but it wasn't the god stones. it wasn't god and they would leave the empty whiskey bottle there <laughs> Or trash. Or trash, what, yeah. Whatever gift they could give to Buddha or whoever right. it was. But anyway, we went there and could always just pray in, in tongues and believe right. that the name of Jesus is higher right. than any other name. And that right. we were his servants there. So we we found two, three high places in Hove, didn't we, Mongolia? Yes. Yeah. Um, but one day it was really exciting that God, God blessed us. We went to uh, uh, one of their gares. Is that you know their? It's, it's also called a yurt. It's a Mongolian house. It's a tent, and it's covered with felt, and the felt keeps out the wind. And it's uh, it's about uh, twenty feet across. It's round, and uh, you go in there, and they served us kumis, which is tea. fermented ma mare's milk, 
That was their tea. And so we, we joined them, and it tasted good, actually. Not bad at all. <laughs> uh, very interesting. They were very cordial to us, and the, our, our uh, tra travel agent could, could speak English. Yes. So we could talk about Jesus, that Jesus lives inside us, that we're called right. um, uh, to be intercessors, to be his children. You're chosen. So we could spread the gospel as much as we could there right. and just believe that whatever seeds you plant, that they will not return void. Right. So One more story. Uh, I want to explain to you how God can protect you in a dangerous uh, situation. In our school in Burma, uh, we you would usually send the students out every third week into the jungle to evangelize. And they would leave Monday morning and come back Friday evening. And they did a wonderful job because they speak the language, the Karen language. And of course, they would go to the hill country. And in the hill country, these people had never heard of Jesus at all, nor who he is or what he does. And so they had some good results there. And uh, we sent out a team, usually, in fact, at that time, we had 20 people, 20 students. But we sent out five teams of four people each. And uh, we try and, and mix them up so that we got an apostle and a prophet and an evangelist. And anyway, uh, as many of the fivefold ministry gifts as we could. And so Friday evening, uh, we, we had had the experience on Friday. The Burmese planes flew over all day, and uh, they would fly over the campus, and we had covered the uh, girls' dormitory and the boys' dormitory with branches, leaves, and uh, so that the galvanized iron wouldn't reflect the sun. And uh, then when they got over beyond the river, they'd strafe and bomb. That's right. And uh, so we were concerned about our people who we had set out. Well, four teams came back by Friday afternoon, and they had done very well. The fifth team didn't come back. We prayed for them, and we were quite apprehensive about it. About nine o'clock, in full darkness, they came back. And they it was as if they had just experienced a revival. They were singing and laughing and talking. And we, we said, oh, we're so relieved. Tell us what happened. Why are you so late? <laughs> and they said, well, we were going up the mountain by this one village and this Burmese plane saw us and attacked us and dropped a bomb on us. I said, what did you do? Here's what they told us. We laid on our backs and prayed in tongues and watched the bomb come down. I said, what happened? They said the bomb hit right in the middle of our group and did not go off. Hallelujah. Yes. It would have destroyed them, all of them. Yes. And God yes. was able to protect them. Yes. The bomb did not explode. I see Amy Marenko Gay, and she was with us <laughs> there. Not that trip, but anyway. So that that was a, a real testimony, and the students were so thrilled that they were singing as if they had been revived because they had seen the mighty hand of God protect them supernaturally. And he'll do that for you, folks. He'll do the same thing. Let's pray for them. We got more stories in there. Go ahead. Running out you of time. pray for them. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Father, you are so wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. You have angels assigned to us. And as we remember all these stories, there's so many more as we recall. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you for all those intercessors who prayed for us before we went through the years. We never lacked a thing. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you. Oh, even we when we got attacked um, physically, 
with uh, malaria and other things, Lord Jesus, you took care of us. So we proclaim that those who listen to these messages will grow in faith. We are growing in faith too, Jesus. Oh, teach us more about you. Teach us. Teach us. We will want to know more about you. Give us wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That we that the eyes of our heart are open. And then we know the greatness of your power to us who believe. So we bless you, everyone that has come. Uh, share this. And you probably have stories too. But Lord, bless you, heal you. We send out his healing power right. that comes from him. Him, we boast about him. He is, um, he is gracious. He is merciful. He is, he is kind. His, his mercy reaches up to the heavens. He delights in unchanging love. He is so wonderful, so wonderful. So we say, uh, we bless you all in the mighty right. name of Jesus. And <laughs> just remember... You carry the creator of the universe around inside your body. Yes. You carry the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in your body. And they are on hand to do whatever needs to be done. It just requires you to ask. In fact, you can require it. If his words abide in you and you abide in him, John 15, 7 says you can ask what you will. You can require what you will and it will be done for you. Hallelujah. Thanks for listening. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Bye-bye.